We have really been blessed with a beautiful day, haven't we? All right. And we're already behind, is that correct? Well, tough. That just means at Mass, Father's got to really shorten his homily. All right, well, I want to talk about, first of all, how I came up with what I'm going to talk about. A couple of months ago, Bob Hot gave me a call and just said, we would like you to speak at the first men's, Men of the East retreat. And, and I asked, well, do you want me to tell, tell, me, tell you my story? And he said, to be honest, we want something uplifting. <laughs> all right, all right, that's a lie. <laughs> bless, bless me, Father. But he really didn't give me any direction. So I thought about it for a couple of weeks, and I thought I had something in mind. And then a few weeks after that, I was listening to a, a, a recording of the Word of God conference, which was all about the sacraments of service, marriage, and the priesthood. And in particular, it was one on understanding St. Paul's message for the Christian family, Ephesians chapter 5. That's the one that has the reading, wives be subordinate, subordinate to your husbands. You all know that reading, and you probably enjoy it. But do, but do you know what he says after that? that? That's what I thought. But you will. All right. So I was listening to this talk, reflecting on that, and then that afternoon, um, a lady came in to talk to me about a wedding that was coming up. I was going to be doing her wedding in about a month, and she came in to talk to me about the readings that they were going to have for Scripture. And she presented me with a question, and she said, can you explain this reading for me? And it was from Ephesians 5. Wives, be subordinate to your husbands. And I said, are you serious? And she was by herself. I've never had a couple even bring up that request for a reading for a, for a wedding, let alone the bride herself. So I explained a little bit, and she said, that's what we want for our wedding. And I said, okay. That evening, Bob called me and said, have you thought about what you want to talk about? And I said, yeah. I'm going to talk about living as a Christian family in a pagan world. And he said, that sounds good, because really what he wanted was something that extended what came from the men's conference in February. And I've heard about uh, several times even today we want to talk about marriage and family life. Father Don mentioned earlier that through this day, we want to end up with some sort of a special or spousal union with Christ. Not just today, but in the end, okay, when we, when we finally get there. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, is living as a Christian family in a pagan world. So what I'd like to do to begin with, then, is open with a prayer to St. Joseph, who is obviously patron of families. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In our tribulation we fly to thee, O blessed Joseph, and after employing the help of thy most holy spouse, we, we ask also with confidence for thy patronage. By the affection with which which united thee to the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God and the paternal love with which thou didst embrace the child Jesus, we beseech thee to look kindly upon the inheritance which Jesus Christ acquired by his precious blood and by thy powerful aid to help us in our needs. Protect most careful guardian of the Holy Family, the chosen people of Jesus Christ. Keep us most loving Father from all pestilence of error and corruption. Be merciful also to us, most powerful protector from thy place in heaven in this warfare with the powers of darkness. And as thou did rescue the child Jesus from the danger of death, so now defend the holy church of God from the snares of the enemy and from all adversity. Guard each one of us by thy perpetual patron patronage so that sustained by thine example and help, we may live in holiness, die a holy death, and obtain the everlasting happiness of heaven. Amen. Amen. 
All right, now as I mentioned, when I was deciding to do this, I was listening to this conference and listening to the talk on family life uh, at, with, with, in the context of marriage. So the bulk of this talk is plagiarized, borrowed, borrowed from this talk. So it's not all mine. So I just give credit to them. All right, several years ago, and I'm guessing probably when I say several, about eight or 10 years ago, I walked back into the um, sacristy and I was preparing a homily, which the readings for that day included Ephesians 5, wives be subordinate to your husbands. Now, anybody here who might be a lector or know anything about the lectionary, when this reading comes up every three years in the cycle, there's a little place of this reading that's got brackets around it, okay? That means we have the option of not including that for a shorter reading. Guess which part of this reading has the brackets around it that could be omitted? Wives, be subordinate to your husbands. And that's really, un yeah, I heard someone go, ooh. Okay, that's really unfortunate because we don't get to hear the fullness of the word of God when we do that. We can pick and choose what we want to listen to. Well, I had prepared my homily including this because I had a different spin on it. And when I walked back into the sacristy, a lady was there who was going to be the lector for that evening. And when I, I don't want to say that she is a feminist. Okay, she was a feminist. <laughs> and I said, we're doing the long version of the second reading today. Oh, if looks could kill. And I said, trust me, it'll be okay. So, so what is this reading? And this is, this is the reading in full. Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church. He himself, the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. That's the parts in brackets. And it's about this time that the wives in the pews are going like this, and the husbands are going like this. Okay. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over to her for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of the water of the word that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes it and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and his church. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 32. So what are we to make of this passage? How are we as Catholics supposed to understand these verses, these words? And we usually find one of two extremes that when we hear this. Now, obviously, the one we hear most is Paul hates women because he's asking women to be doormats for their husbands. Now, trust me, or answer truthfully, you as husbands, isn't there a part of you that says, yeah, that'd be pretty cool? But we know, okay, that's really not what he meant. But have we really thought about what this means? Is Paul a misogynist? Is he asking husbands to be tyrants? What does he mean when he says, subordinate yourself? Now, different translations are going to have different things. You'll see be subject to, be subordinate to, be submissive to. These are all good translations. I'm going to focus on subordinate and submissive, and I'll talk about what those actually mean later on. But if we really want to understand what Paul is trying to say in this passage, 
we must learn how to read and understand Scripture properly. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church gives us some good advice on this. And we should understand that when we read a passage in Scripture, are we looking at just that passage alone to give us the full meaning of the Scripture? Now, our obvious answer to that should be no. Okay, so this is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church has to say. And if anybody's taking notes, we're looking at Catechism Numbers 105, through 114. I'm not going to quote every single one of those, but it begins by saying that God is the author of sacred scripture. The divinely revealed realities which are contained and presented in the text of the sacred scripture have been written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if we believe that the Holy Spirit is truly the author of sacred scripture, ultimately, then we can't believe that what these words are saying can be false, okay? So the women out there who are listening to this saying that can't be what Paul means. For us men as Catholics and looking at this saying, well, no, he really can't ask me to be a tyrant, so what is he calling me to? In sacred scripture, God speaks to man in a human way. To interpret scripture correctly, the reader must be attentive to what the human authors truly wanted to affirm and to what God wanted to reveal to us by their words. And in order to discover the sacred author's intention, the reader must take into account the conditions of their time and culture, the literary genres used at that time, and the modes of feeling, speaking, and narrating then current. So we have to look at what was going on at the time that Paul was writing, what was the world like at that time, and how did that fit into what he was trying to say? So we can't necessarily put it in our own contemporary terms to say this is what Paul meant because that's what's going on now. Now, obviously, we're, we're seeing a whole movement in the world today, and if this reading were to take in by itself, then people would just throw away the Bible entirely because this can't be what the real meaning of it is in today's world, especially when we see this Me Too movement and the empowerment of women, okay? For the fact is that truth is differently presented and expressed in the various types of historical writing, in prophetical and poetic texts, texts and in other forms of literary expression. So we have different kinds of reading in the Bible that is going to give different meanings to what we're reading. But since sacred scripture is inspired, there is another and no less important principle of correct interpretation without which scripture would remain a dead letter. And this is where we're going to get into how do we interpret this particular passage. Sacred scripture must be read and interpreted in the light of the same spirit in whom it was written. The Second Vatican Council indicates three criteria for interpreting scripture in accordance with the spirit who inspired it. The first is the most important for this talk. Be especially attentive to the content and unity of the whole scripture. In other words, a verse by itself or a little passage by itself isn't enough to get the entire picture. This is what's unfortunate when we get to the lectionary that we read at Mass because, as you've noticed, especially in the second reading of our Sunday Masses, these readings are usually taken in a consecutive pattern going through this letter or that letter, and we only get a snippet of that. And too often, since our focus is on what the gospel is, the second reading doesn't usually have a place that ties in with the gospel reading for that day. So what we hear, like with this reading here today, we don't hear it preached, which is unfortunate. So too many people then are afraid to have that little bracketed part read in, on Sunday because I'm not going to preach on it and I don't want anybody to have any presuppositions about what they want it to mean, so we're going to block it out entirely. That's unfortunate. Different as the books which composed it may be, Scripture is a unity by reason of the unity of God's plan of which Jesus is the center and the heart which was opened since Passover. So what that's saying is all of Scripture is a unity. And if you want to understand part of it, you have to understand the whole picture. 
So when we look at this reading from Ephesians chapter 5, we have to look at what's around it in order to see, okay, is he leading up to something to say this is what this is getting at? That's what we're going to be discussing in just a couple of minutes. This is why Catholic teaching of interpreting the Bible says that we must take the entire context and unity of sacred scripture into account. Otherwise, if we just try to interpret one particular passage by itself out of context, we can get ourselves into trouble. This is what normally happens when we look at this reading from Ephesians by itself without looking at whatever else St. Paul has to say. Okay, criteria number two. Read the scripture within the living tradition of the whole church. According to a saying of the Father, sacred scripture is written principally in the church's heart rather than in documents and records, for the church carries in her tradition, the living memorial of God's word, and it is the Holy Spirit who gives her the spiritual interpretation of the scripture. So that's saying that the church has been empowered by the Holy Spirit to interpret scripture for us. In other words, I can't read it and just come up with my own ideas about what it is. It can have an impact on me without other influences. But the actual interpretation of this scripture is left to the church. And that should be our guiding force. And number three, be attentive to the analogy of faith. By analogy of faith, we mean the coherence of the truths of faith among themselves and within the whole plan of revelation. What that's telling us is that the coherence of truth is that all of Scripture and all of the traditional teaching of the church has truth to it, and it all has an effect on what this particular passage might mean. Okay, with that background then on how to interpret Scripture, by the way, we could do a whole course on that, but this is just a little snippet from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But with that in mind, let's go back and then look at this reading that we have in context. So what is Paul saying in this passage from Ephesians chapter 5? But if we want to do that, we have to go back. We have to go back in that letter to find out what Paul is saying somewhere else. And it's important to notice, like what we said before, what's the cultural context in which Paul is writing? And, he's, and it's important to note that the audience to whom Paul is writing are recent converts to Christianity. They're new, but they're not converts from Judaism. They're converts from Greco-Roman paganism. And that has a great deal to affect what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 5. And it's about renouncing their former life in paganism. So if we go back to Ephesians chapter 4, this is what Paul says. So I declare and testify in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, darkened in understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance, because of their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have handed themselves over to licentiousness for the practice of every kind of impurity to excess. Now Paul goes on to a great deal more in describing that kind of stuff at the end of Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32. So that would be a good one to look at what he's diving at here. But he goes on to say, that is not how you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard of him and were taught in him as truth as in Jesus, that you should put away the old self of your former way of life, corrupted through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self, created in God's way, after the likeness of God, in righteousness and holiness of truth. So what is he saying here when he's saying to put away the old self and put on the new self? What might he be talking about here? Baptism. These are folks who have been pagans, living in a Greco-Roman world. They've heard the gospel, and they want to be a part of it. So they've been baptized. They're recent converts. And then Paul is calling them to change their way of life from what you know, to do something new. So it's about renouncing their former way of life. Now, what was that way of life like? Well, when we get to the beginning of chapter 5 in the book, in the book of Ephesians, this is what Paul has to say about renouncing the pagan immorality. This is what was going on in the world at the time. And Paul says, so be imitators of God 
highlight that. Be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love. As Christ loved us and handed himself over for us as a sacrificial offering to God for a fragrant aroma. So he's telling them not only to just imitate God, but to give yourselves. Immorality. And, talk, and Paul, the Greek word here is porneia, which we get the word pornography from. He's talking about sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be mentioned among you as is fitting among the holy ones. No obscenity or silly or suggestive talk. So those jokes that we like to pass on once in a while, no more of that. But instead, thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no immoral, and the Greek there is pornoi, pornoi, or impure or greedy person, that is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So he's saying right there, if you're still practicing this stuff, you're going to be cut out of the kingdom. And he goes on to say, let no one deceive you with empty arguments. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient. So do not be associated with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless works of darkness. Rather, expose them. For it is shameful even to mention the things done by them in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. So no matter what you do, I mean, you can't even hide if you want to do some of these things in secret because it will be found out. And he concludes this section by saying, Watch carefully then how you live, not as foolish persons but as wise, making the most of the opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not continue in ignorance, but try to understand what is the will of the Lord. And do not get drunk on wine, which li in which lies debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and playing to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks always and everything for the, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. And that's Ephesians chapters 5, 1 through 20. That leads up right to this point that we get to in um, the, the talk that we're going to be talking about. So Paul here is explaining to them what is going on in the world at the time. And if it sounds familiar, it's because it should. We're living in a world that's very similar to that. So what's Paul telling the Ephesians? Number one, imitate God. What God does, you do. Number two, walk as Christ walked. Live in love, giving yourself in sacrifice. What does he mean by that? Well, again, Paul is kind of echoing something he'll say later on in his letter to the Romans, chapter 12, where he says, I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Walk as Christ walked. How did Christ walk? What did he do? He gave himself up in sacrifice. What are we supposed to do, St. Paul says? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Avoid sexual immorality because it has no place among the holy ones or the saints. You. It has no place in that. So avoid sexual immorality of all kinds. It has its place, and that place is in the context of marriage. Be why? Because it destroys the soul, and it merits exclusion from the kingdom of heaven. In other words, we've inherited that. God has given it to us. But if we practice this stuff, we lose that inheritance. That kind of gets away from that whole thought of once saved, always saved. These guys have been baptized. They've seen the Lord. They want him. And now they're part of it. But if they go back and practice this stuff, they lose their inheritance. That's what Paul's saying. There, there is no once saved, always saved. Now, what was the first century paganism like in the Roman Empire? It wasn't pretty. We think that abortion is just a recent thing, like in this past century. 
the Greco-Roman world was rife with it. They got rid of babies. If they didn't want them, they got rid of them. It was not uncommon if a baby was disfigured or if a family wanted a boy or a girl and they had the opposite. It ended up in the drain under the house or it ended up on the hillside to die of exposure. That's, that's just how they treated it. it. They did not have any sacredness or dignity of life because babies weren't seen as valuable in that regard. They were seen as a commodity. And if they weren't going to help me out, expose them. That's what they did. So in this same way, contraception, not having babies, was also common. It was actually a practice for the Roman government to have a program to pay families to have children because they were dying out. Look at where we are right now. I mean, we are not in a good situation because people are not having babies. They're not raising families, especially, and I'm sad, sad to say this, among Catholic families. They're not producing. And we need to do that, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of Christ and his church to proclaim God. And it's a sin that we're not, that we're not doing this. But there are groups that are, you might say, mass producing, and they're going to take over. Look at what's going on with the Muslim faith right now. It is rapidly increasing, and they're doing this in a way to promote their own faith. And it will be taken, we will be taken over if we don't do something in a hurry. Going on from that, another thing that was practiced widely in the Greco-Roman world was homosexuality, homosexual sex. It, it was, it was um, a status symbol to be able to have a young boy at your disposal or a young girl or to practice homosexual sex and still have a family. This was going on, and Paul is saying, you are imitators of Christ now. You must have no part of this. Why? Like I mentioned before, because you will lose your inheritance that you, that you received at baptism. Okay, with that all in mind, let's go back again to this reading from Ephesians chapter 5, which is commonly called, sometimes you'll see it as a heading in your Bible, either called the family code or the household code. Let's look at that opening line. St. Paul begins by talking about mutual submission within the context of marriage. Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. This entire reading is about relationships. It's not about superiority. See, what's the first thing that we think of when we hear, be subordinate to your husbands? We talk about who is more superior. But that's not what it, because he begins this whole talk with, be subordinate to one another. And why? Out of reverence for Christ. This mutual submission or submission, subordination or submission implies the equal dignity of man and woman. This is what the church believes about the biblical teaching of the equal dignity of a man and a woman. We get this from Genesis chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We were all created in the equal image and likeness of God. This message that Paul is giving was new. Everything St. Paul says about the relationship between husbands and wives, it's a radical vision for the Christian family that has to do with their identity in Christ not in the secular world, in Christ. He's telling the church in Ephesus that they need to imitate God, to walk as Christ walked, and giving themselves in sacrifice to each other and to the church. Now, some of the saints along the way have written about this, believe it or not, talking about this. Saint Pope John Paul II said in a letter, man and woman, he created them, this is what he had to say about mutual submission that we find in Christ. This relationship between spouses is nevertheless 
not one-sided submission. According to the teaching of Ephesians, marriage excludes this element of, of the contract, which weighed on the institution and at times does not cease to weigh on it. So always and everywhere, we are to mutually submit ourselves to our spouses, us to our wives, our wives to us. It's, it's that way, and that's always going to be the way it is. Husband and wife are, in fact, subject to one another, mutually subordinated to one another. The source of this reciprocal submission lies in Christian piety, and that, that means that's how we express our faith, and its expression is love. Okay, so that's that first line, be subordinate to one another. But so St. Paul has a message for Christian wives. That's the brackets. And by the way, Paul did not put the brackets in there. <laughs> wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of his wife just as Christ is head of the church. Notice he puts that as Christ is head of the church. He himself the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Okay, so what's Paul getting at here? What does Paul mean when he says to be subordinate or submissive? Okay, this is where we want to look at what does that actually mean. In today's terms, it usually means superiority. Okay, I have to bow to somebody. But that's not what Paul is really talking about. He's talking about subordinate. In other words, sub meaning under, an order meaning an order. There is an order in marriage. There is an order in family life, and we have to follow that. We have to be under that. The same thing about to be submissive, missio. We must be under the mission of. And Paul is saying that you must be under the mission of your husband. So what is the mission of the husband? Well, the husband works for the salvation of the wife, just as Christ is the Savior of the church. It's our job to get our wives to heaven. Now, this section, while it is a message to Paul, to, from Paul to the wife, to the Christian wives, it's as much about the husbands as it is the wife. So it's our job to get our wives to heaven. It's our job to make them holy. Okay? Now, what wife wouldn't want to be submissive to that? Is he saying that you have to follow his every whim? Well, we're going to find out later that's not really what he means. But we are to work for the salvation of the wife. And why? Because Christ is Savior of the church. Okay, so looking back at somebody else who wrote extensively on this. Pope Pius XI wrote in 1930. This is before all the big women's lib movement before the 70s and 60s, he wrote this letter called Casti Canubi, and it's on Christian marriage. And he has this whole section that he talks about Christian wives. This is what he has to say. Domestic society being confirmed, therefore, by this bond of love, there should flourish in it that order of love. So this is where we get the word subordinate. There is an order to the love in this family, as St. Augustine calls it. This order includes both the primacy of the husband with regard to the wife and children, the ready subjection of the wife and her willing obedience, which the apostle commands in these words, let their women be subject to their husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is head of the wife and Christ is head of the church. Now here again, we hear about the husband being head. In today's contemporary terms, what, do we th what, what does that normally imply? Well, he's the boss. We have to obey. Okay, But is that really what Paul is saying? Well, you could probably guess that my answer would be, not really. I didn't say no specifically, but I said not really. He goes on to say, this subjection, however does not deny or take away the liberty which fully belongs to the woman, both in view of her dignity as a human person, getting back to Genesis chapter 1, equal dignity with the man, and in view of her most noble office of, as wife and mother and companion. Do you think today's world would look at a wife and mother as a noble office? No. No. 
No, they, they, that's not what they want because they see that as being beneath, less dignity. Nor does it bid her obey her husband's every request, if not in harmony with right reason or with the dignity due to his wife. So the husband cannot ask his wife to do anything he wishes, especially if it's sinful or harmful to her dignity. He just can't do that. She does not have to submit to any of that. Nor in fine does it imply that the wife should be put on a level with those persons who are in law called minors to whom it is not customary to allow free exercise of their rights on account of their lack of mature judgment or for their ignorance of, hu ignorance of human affairs. So he's saying she can't even be put on the, on the level of the children who do need to follow their parents' will because they are children and they don't have the intellect nor do they have the mature judgment to be able to do what they need to do. They need to follow somebody else. But it forbids that exaggerated liberty which cares not for the good of the family. It forbids that in this body, which is the family, notice that language, the family is a body. I'll get to that later. The heart, um, it forbids that in the body, which is the family, the heart be separated from the head to the great detriment of the whole body as the proximate danger to ruin. Think about Paul's letter to the Corinthians when he talks about the different parts of the body. None of them can exist by itself without the other. They have to work together. And he says, for if the man is the head, then the woman is the heart. And as he occupies the chief place in ruling, so she may and ought to claim for herself the chief place in love. Now that's a beautiful way to look at the family as a body with the husband as the head and the wife as the heart. And here we get to the equal dignity. Which one is more superior? Which one is more important? Don't you dare say the head. Don't you dare say the heart. Because can a body live without a head? It cannot. Can it live without a heart? No. Okay, now again, this kind of line is upsetting to, in today's world because the women, and I, I'm not trying to bash women, but the women's movement today wants that ruling part. But they also want the heart. They can't have both. What happens to a head with two bodies? What would happen to a business with two presidents? What would happen to a parish with two pastors? It dies because it doesn't have the heart. And so what, what Paul the, the, or Pope Pius XI is saying here is a beautiful expression of the family as a body with a head and a heart. And it has an order to it. Okay? Again, this subjection of wife to husband in its degree and manner may vary according to the different conditions of persons, places, and times. Which means different cultures, different areas, different times of the world they're going to have different roles and they're going to have different levels of authority in the household. But in the end, he's still saying the husband should take the place of head and the wife should take the place of the heart. And it makes sense. But he does say, in fact, if the husband neglects his duty, it falls to the wife to take his place in directing the family. But the structure of the family and its fundamental law, established and confirmed by God, must always and everywhere be maintained intact. And that's Paul the Levin's letter called Casti Canubi that he wrote in 1930. And he's calling for men to take their place and to assume responsibility for who they are as men and husbands. And we have to do that in today's world because what's today's world view of the husband and of men? Do you watch many TV shows or see commercials today? How are men portrayed? As bumbling idiots, aren't we? Okay, even though the show is hilarious, Raymond is not the ideal husband for us to be. And while Tim the Toolman Taylor, if you remember him, while he was macho and rah rah, what was he like in the family situation? He was debased by his wife, and that was okay. But that's not what Paul is calling us as husbands to be. But it's not just Paul the Eleventh. St. John Chrysostom, who lived in the 4th uh, and 5th century, A.D., by the way, 
also had something to say about this letter. He actually has a whole homily that's about 20 pages long on Ephesians chapter 5. I'm only going to quote one little piece of that. God's purpose in ordering marriage is peace. One takes the husband's role, one takes the wife's role, in one in guiding, one in supporting. If both had the very same roles, there would be no peace. The house is not rightly governed when all have precisely the same roles. You can't have two heads. There must be a differentiation of roles under a single head. And see, here again, this, is, this gets to be where, where I am so frustrated with the way the world is looking at, at men today because it doesn't want women to be just equal. I have no problem at all with equality. What I do have a problem is with is when they want to be the same. Women are not the same as men. There's even a movement to change that in the world. They're not the same. They're equal, but they're different. And that is important for us. Okay, now, St. Paul also has a message for Christian husbands. Now, if you look at this reading carefully and count the verses, you'll notice he has three verses attributed to women, to Christian wives. How many, how many uh, verses do you think he has attributed to, for the husbands? Twice that many. Why do you suppose that might be? Well, probably because we need a little bit more instruction sometimes. Not like Raymond. But, but this is what St. Paul has to say. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over to her to sanctify her, cleansing, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word that he might present him to himself the, the church in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Here again gets to the mission of what a husband does and what Christ does for the church. He washes her. He cleanses her. He makes her holy, and he saves her. He prepares her for salvation. So also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes it and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So again, he's talking about the family unit as a body, and he is its head. And we are the members. Now, I'll get to that part in a minute, but he's talking specifically right now about the family. Okay? Now, what's he saying here? He's commanding husbands. He's not suggesting or he's not inviting them. He commands husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her. What does this mean? Look at the crucifix. That's what that means. That's what that means. That's what it means to be a Christian husband. It's a sacrificial love. How well do you think this message was received to the people that Paul was writing to? Probably not very well, because this was new. It was radical. And it went against everything that that culture and time knew. So what's the purpose of the husband's love? Not for my benefit. It's for hers. It's to sanctify her, to make her holy, and to help her get to heaven. That's why we call matrimony one of the two sacraments of service. Okay. If you look at all the other sacraments, all seven of them, five of them, when they are received, the purpose of receiving the purpose of those is to sanctify the person who is receiving the sacrament. Baptism, first communion, reconciliation, confirmation. Did I say that? Um, anointing of the sick. All of those recipients, the purpose and the sole recipient is the person who's being sanctified. It's for the purpose of their holiness. Holy matrimony and ordination, those are, are designated for the service of others. Okay? The priest is ordained, not for his benefit, not to get him to heaven, but help you get to heaven. 
we, are, we, we receive the sacrament of, of holy matrimony, not for my benefit, not for my good, but for my spouse's. That's what, my, that's what I'm ordered toward when I get married, okay? Subordination. This should tell us very clearly that Paul is not telling husbands that they could be tyrants in the house because Christ was anything but a tyrant. If we're supposed to imitate Christ, we don't abuse. We don't take advantage. He was a servant. That's how Christ leads, and that's how he is telling husbands to lead, to climb up on the cross. Spiritual leadership is at the head of the husband's role in the family. Spiritual leadership. Because if we can't lead our family spiritually, then we can't lead them at all. Remember that the primary duty or the mission of the husband is to get his wife to heaven. You want to love your wife? Suffer with her. Die for her. Because when you suffer more, you love more. Now, I said I was only going to read a little snippet of St. John Chrysostom. I lied. Bless me, Father. Okay, St. John Chrysostom in that long homily always ha also has a section for husbands. And this is what he says. Have you noticed the measure of obedience? Pay attention to love's high standard. If you take the premise that your wife should submit to you, and we, we understand what submission should mean now, as the church submits to Christ, then you should also take the same kind of careful, sacrificial thought for her that Christ takes for the church. So St. John Chrysostom is telling us, do what Christ did, die for her. Even if you must offer your own life for her, you must not refuse. Even if you must undergo countless struggles on her behalf and have all kinds of things to endure and to suffer, you must not refuse. For you are already married when you act this way, whereas Christ is acting for one who has rejected and hated him. Christ did this for someone who did not love him. So just as he, Christ, when she was rejecting, hating, spurning, and nagging him, brought her to trust him by his great solicitude, not by threatening, not by lording it over her or intimidating her or anything like that, so you must also act toward your wife. Even if you see her looking down on you, nagging and despising her, despising you, that never happens with any of us, does it? You will be able to win her over with your great love and affection for her. And that's St. John Chrysostom. His message, St. Paul's message for husbands, is equally, if not more important than his message to Christian wives. So let's finish up with what Paul has to say. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. He sews it up with that connection, and that's really what it's all about. Now, what's he saying? The wife is the body of her husband, just as the church is the body of Christ. Where does he get this imagery? Where does he get this idea? Well, from the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. She came out of his body, and when they are joined together, they become one because they are one body. Jesus also refers to this passage from Genesis and his debate with the Pharisees about divorce when he adds, So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So not, not only is she a part of his body, but now that they are joined together in the bond and sacrament of marriage, that's a divinely inspired union blessed by the church as a sacrament, and not man shall put it asunder. No one can tear it apart because it's been divinely brought together. Marriage is not a ball and chain, but it is the cross. 
But we can't love like that naturally. That's why we need the grace of the sacrament. And those of you who, hear, who are here who are not married and want to be, learn how to love like that. And if you're not planning on marriage, hopefully then a vocation to the priesthood or a, or the, uh, a religious life will be in, your, in the works. You'll learn how to sacrifice in another but no less important way. We can become living images of the sacrificial love of Jesus for his bride. That's why Paul says this is a great mystery. In Greek, that word is mega mysterion. In Latin, it is magnum sacramentum. I speak in reference to Christ and the church. It's a sacrament of service ordered towards the holiness of others. Now, Paul is, strictly speaking, talking about marriage. He's, is, he's, of course, talking about the proper marriage relationship between Christians. That's who his letter is ordered toward. But, as we've seen, that's not his primary subject. His main topic is Christ and Christ's relationship to the church. What we see in this section of Paul's letter to the Ephesians is the spousal union of Christians as a living metaphor taken from real life, but whose meaning far transcends human relationships. So what we're seeing in this is Paul is talking to Christian households, husbands and wives, and how they're supposed to live as Christians in a pagan world. But what he's really implying here is this should model Christ's love for his church. And your examples of that. Paul is saying that human marriage instituted a creation, Genesis chapter 2, we just quoted that, without the destructive force of sin, of course, points to a greater reality than itself, namely the marriage of Christ and his church. And in this reading, Paul reveals another mystery, being married to Jesus. What Father Don mentioned earlier on in his introduction when he says, what's our ultimate goal? Spousal union with Christ. Marriage brings about a one-body relationship. It's not me and my wife. It's us. The church is the body of Christ by being virtue of being the bride of Christ. Think about it. What do we call a Christian household? The domestic church. Okay, now what does that mean? That we can have mass in our own homes by ourselves? No. Let's hope not. We call ourselves, as church, the body of Christ. So the domestic church at home is like a microcosm of the larger body of Christ, which is the church. So St. Paul's message is just as true today as it was nearly 2,000 years ago. It's hard, and it takes grace. But if we listen, and if we love like Paul is telling us to love, then we can be examples in this world of sin that so desperately needs it. Like what, the, the more things change, the more things they stay the same. Isn't that true? Why? To show the great mystery of Jesus' love for his bride, which is the church. But if we don't speak and act and look differently from the rest of the world and show our love and joy as Christians and as Christ's spouse, then how is anyone else going to say, I want some of that. I want to be a Christian. When we look at all this in light of what we've just heard, what we've seen, and how Jesus, as head of the church, shows us as husbands and as men how to lead. He gives himself completely to us and to the Father. He holds nothing back, and he does this in order to sanctify us, to make us holy. This is why we call the Mass the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because of the cross, Jesus' complete gift of self is how he loves his bride, the church. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Let us as men gathered here today see our role in the family as leaders, but also as servants. To be submissive to you, to our spouses, but also to take the leadership role that you call us to.
May our minds and our hearts be opened to, what it, uh, to whatever it is that you would have us hear so that we may go forth from this day, live the life that Paul is asking us to live and to be men in the world. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Paul, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Bartholomew, pray for us.